Mary I was born on February 18, 1516. She was the Queen of England and Ireland between 1553 and her death, being also Queen Consort of Spain from 1556. Daughter of Henry VIII with his first wife Catherine of Aragon, she was the fourth and penultimate monarch of the House of Tudor. When she ascended to the throne in 1553, Mary Tudor was received with ecstasy. Five years later, she was already widely hated and feared. In her short and violent reign, almost 300 people were burned in the name of religion. Nicknamed Bloody Mary, she somehow tried to do her best for her subjects. But the nickname Bloody became popular, and almost five centuries after her death, she is still known by this epithet. Princess Mary was not the first daughter of Henry VIII with Catherine of Aragon. Before, she had lost three boys and a girl. The royal couple must have lived moments of great anxiety, hoping for the survival of their precious daughter. Princess Mary was received with a huge baptismal ceremony. A source of pride for her father, Mary was the greatest pearl in the kingdom, but that doesn't mean they spent a lot of time together. In her childhood, she only saw her father on special occasions. As usual, she was a pawn in her father's diplomacy. At the age of two, her marriage was negotiated with the Dauphin of France, but the contract lasted only four years, and the princess was promised to her mother's cousin, the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, Charles V, who was 22 years old. The union never materialized. She would end up marrying his son, Philip II. Mary received a rigorous and complete education, which gave her a solid basis of knowledge about the classics and the scriptures. However, she was overprotected in relation to the outside world, feelings, and moral issues. For example, one of her servants reported that she knew no swear words or insults at age 30. The young Princess Mary proved to be a capable student and an obedient child, but she inherited her father's passion for horseback riding, hunting, and falconry. Like Henry VIII, she liked music and dance. In the beginning, he gave her political guidance. One of the most important roles of the heir to the throne was to be Prince of Wales. In 1525, she assumed this position, though unofficially. The young princess was training for the role of sovereign, with a growing awareness that one day she could be queen. But the girl's joy lasted little. In 1527, the king informed the queen that he wanted a divorce. The next five years were a terrible time for Mary, who was forced to witness her father's rejection before her mother. The princess, who had been the dearest of the court, stopped seeing the king regularly. She spent long hours with her distressed mother, watching the queen's desperate fight to keep her dignity. Between 11 and 17 years old, Mary faced a harsh reality and an uncertain future. She would be the bastard daughter of Henry VIII if he managed to annul the marriage. One month after Elizabeth's birth, Mary lost her princess title and was ordered to move to Hatfield, where she would be the bridesmaid of Prince Elizabeth. In 1533, she moved to Hatfield. She became known as Lady Mary without any reference to the word princess. She was humiliated by the other servants of Princess Elizabeth. However, she had a striking temper. When she was called Lady Mary, she didn't answer, and she didn't call her half-sister a princess either. For that, she was punished, and her jewels and clothes were confiscated. Her greatest stalker was Lady Shelton, and Boleyn's aunt, who even slapped her when she claimed to be a real princess. But the most painful thing was her father's visits to Elizabeth, preceded by orders for her eldest daughter to be locked up. Two weeks before her 19th birthday, Mary fell seriously ill. The symptoms included stomach pains and depression, which would haunt her for the rest of her life. While she was bedridden, battered by pain and fever, there were rumors of her poisoning. Henry VIII decided to take her out of Hatfield. When she moved to live in the royal palace of Greenwich, she quickly began to recover her health. On January 12, 1536, when she was still convalescing, she received the news that her mother had died. Three years had passed since Mary had last seen Catherine. She was not allowed to attend her mother's funeral. Mary's future seemed bleak. But four months later, Henry VIII separated from Anne Boleyn. She was executed, and the king married Jane Seymour. Jane's attitude toward Mary was the opposite of Anne Boleyn. The new stepmother got the king to see her daughter again after five years of separation. It was probably an exciting encounter for her. Reports say that Henry VIII expressed deep regret for being away from Mary for so long. 
but her return to court depended on signing a document presented by his father. In the document, she recognized that her mother's marriage was illegal. Under tremendous pressure, she signed it, but never forgave herself for betraying her mother's memory. The union in the new family lasted little. In October, Prince Edward was born. Twelve days later, Queen Jane died, and Henry VIII immersed himself in various diplomatic matters. Henry VIII was not so restrained in married life. In January 1540, he married Anne of Cleves, quickly succeeded by Catherine Howard. Mary was only five years older than Catherine, and had several reasons not to like her. Besides being related to Anne Boleyn, her extravagant behavior was considered repugnant by Henry VIII's modest daughter. But Catherine was instantly sent to the Tower of London, and the king was single again. The sixth wife was relief to Mary. She thought Catherine Parr was an intelligent, pious, and common-sense woman. In the last four years of Henry VIII's life, Mary was often at court, in the company of the king, the queen, Lady Elizabeth, and Prince Edward. In those few but precious years, Mary lived with her brothers in a way that had never been possible before. Henry VIII died a month before Mary's 31st birthday. Edward was crowned king, and Mary took precautions and retired to East Anglia. As England, now under Edward VI, moved towards Protestantism, Mary intensified her devotions, attending up to four masses a day. She was encouraged by Charles V to keep the Catholic faith alive in England. Because of her religious convictions, she quickly came into conflict with John Dudley, counselor and guardian of King Edward VI. He banned Catholic masses in England, but Mary disrespected the decision. Dudley accused her of preparing a coup. In February 1553, Edward VI became terribly ill. Mary traveled to London to see her brother, but she realized that the king was about to die. Edward VI died on July 6. England plunged into a war for the throne. Dudley's son received the mission to capture Mary, because she would be Edward VI's successor. Dudley's plan was to put his daughter-in-law on the throne, Lady Jane Grey. Mary reacted quickly, declaring herself the rightful queen of England before her households. She sent a message to Dudley, ordering him to proclaim her monarch. Meanwhile, some messengers were sent to gather nobles and pay homage to the new sovereign. Few believed she could overcome Dudley. Mary, however, had begun her march. Hours after her proclamation, gentlemen and plebs gathered to support her. On July 12th, she was gathering her forces. Mary knew that Dudley was leading an army against her. She prepared her resistance. Her supporters were about 15,000, and, one by one, the towns of the southeast started to proclaim her queen. On July 16th, Mary's supporter reached 30,000. On July 18th, Dudley was forced to admit his defeat. The next day, Mary was proclaimed queen in London, among celebrations, bonfires, and the tolling of the bells. With an unshakable belief in her cause, Mary had practically performed a miracle. And on August the 3rd, 1553, she triumphantly entered London. After the turbulence of the last few years, the people were prepared to accept Queen Mary I benevolently. But no one knew what kind of ruler she would be. In fact, the English didn't know how it was like to be ruled by a woman. The last time had happened in the 12th century, when Matilda assumed the throne, a monarch who left no good memories. But Queen Mary had some genuine qualities. She was virtuous, kind, honest, affectionate, and conscientious. But she dangerously believed that God was at her side. In the first months of her reign, her gentle side was the most visible. She punished Dudley for the coup that had put Lady Jane Grey on the throne, but tried to intercede on Jane's behalf. But, step by step, Mary changed the religious affairs. Strong protests broke out all over the country. Religion was a topic that divided Mary I's advisors, who constantly fought amongst themselves, making it almost impossible to make decisions. From the beginning of Mary's reign, there was an important question on everyone's mind. Did the queen want a husband? If so, who? Several candidates were suggested, but Mary had only one man in mind. She wanted to establish an agreement with Philip of Spain, son of his longtime protector, Emperor Charles V. At 27, Philip was 11 years younger than Mary, 
and according to all reports, a worthy, serious, and boring man. His pompous ways made him deeply unpopular with the Spanish people, but that was not what Mary's advisors were most concerned about. As heir to the Habsburg Empire, Philip would inherit from his father total control of Spain and Holland, as well as large parts of the New World. If Mary married him, England ran the risk of becoming an insignificant part of the vast Habsburg domains. Even more worrying, the country would be ruled by a Catholic monarch with close ties to the Pope, something unthinkable for English Protestants. Against this background, Mary did everything to make her dream come true. On November the 8th, 1554, she announced her intention to marry Philip. Some important Protestants were against it. The Parliament asked the Queen to marry an Englishman. Mary ignored it and in January signed a marriage contract with Charles V. The announcement of the contract was cause for pessimism and some nobles prepared a rebellion to replace Mary with her sister Elizabeth. Meanwhile, a fleet of French ships would prevent Philip of Spain from reaching England by sea. Only Lord Wyatt executed the plans of the rebellion. At the end of January 1554, he assembled an army of 3,000 men. Without enthusiasm, Mary asked the Parliament for help. But on February the 1st, she made an inflammatory speech, saying that marriage was a matter of state, an important step for the future of the throne. It was a vibrant speech, and thousands supported her. Wyatt almost reached the Tower of London. There were clashes and was defeated by Mary's supporters. He was tried and executed along with 90 other conspirators, and their decaying bodies were hung from the gallows as a macrobe example. Others were luckier. They knelt in front of Mary and she forgave them. Jane Grey's father played an important role in this conspiracy and she was executed to prevent future rebellions. Elizabeth also became a target for Mary, as she could be a focus of revolt with the growth of Elizabeth's supporters. The younger sister was taken to the tower to tell what she knew about the rebellion, but astutely, Elizabeth managed to distance herself from any association with Wyatt. Even so, she was stuck in the tower for three months. At the end of July 1554, Prince Philip arrived in England to meet the future bride. In his first meeting, he had a perfect posture, although later he described Mary as much older than we were told. Two days after the first meeting, Philip and Mary got married in Westminster Cathedral with a solemn wedding mass. Due to the difference in languages spoken, the royal couple barely communicated at the dance after the wedding. Three months after the wedding, Mary announced her pregnancy. The positive news made the people look at Philip differently. He began to pressure Mary to be crowned King of England. Mary resisted, as she knew it would provoke the revolt of her subjects. In Easter week of 1555, Mary went to Hampton Court to give birth. By the end of April, there was still no news, and some warring rumors began to circulate. The Queen's belly was much smaller than before. Would she have never been pregnant? According to reports at the time, Mary had the symptoms of pregnancy, including menstrual interruption. Her belly was swollen and some milk was coming out of her breasts. Some of these symptoms can be attributed to amenorrhea, a medical condition she has suffered since adolescence, which causes painful and irregular menstruations, as well as swelling of the abdomen and breasts. Some historians suggest that she may have experienced a psychological pregnancy, with psychosomatic symptoms induced by the historical belief that she was expecting a baby. Others consider that she might have a pituitary gland disorder. The weeks passed and the queen did not give birth. The shameful truth emerged, Mary and her doctors had made a mistake about the pregnancy. After nine months, most of the symptoms had disappeared, and in August, she returned to focus on the fair's estate. For many people at court, Philip had a growing interest in Elizabeth. Faced with this, it's easy to guess Mary's feelings when she saw her husband in love with the daughter of the woman who had destroyed her family's stability. It was a sad echo of the last years of Catherine of Aragon. In the first month of her imaginary pregnancy, Mary began a Catholic reform. On November 25th, the Parliament repealed Henry VIII's Act of Supremacy. On December 18th, she upheld the medieval laws on heresy. Mary decreed a hunt for heresy, whose punishment was death. The first executions took place in 1555 and five people were condemned. 
The bravery with which some faced their punishment caused a public commotion, which led the people to remain loyal to the Protestant faith. In the following years, 240 men and 60 women died at the stake. Among these people, there were well-known figures, but most were workers and traders. Throughout Europe, the nickname Bloody Mary became popular. Scottish John Knox wrote about the aberration that was Mary's government, referring also to Marie de Guise, regent of Scotland. But the person responsible for the terrible epithet was John Fox, an evangelical writer and cleric who spent the entire reign of Mary I in exile, compiling stories about anti-papist victims in a work known as the Book of Martyrs. But the Queen was not the only one responsible for the massacres. Archbishop Reginald Pole of Canterbury also had an influence. It is interesting to realize that, for Mary, the punishment of heretics was a mission to save the souls of her subjects from eternal damnation. An identical behavior was also typical in her grandmother, Isabel I of Castile, who popularized the fire of Inquisition as a purge of the people's sins. However, the first absolutist queen of Christianity became known as the Catholic, unlike her granddaughter, who made far fewer victims. Estimates indicate that Henry VIII, between 1509 and 1549, ordered the execution of more than 72,000 people, but this evidence is practically eclipsed by the stereotype of his six consorts. The Queen's sister, Elizabeth I, in 1570 demanded the hanging of 70 northern rebels who planned to free Mary Stuart, the Queen of Scots. However, among her relatives and members of other dynastic houses, the title of Bloodthirsty became more famous with Queen Mary. Plans began to emerge to overthrow Mary. In the last days of 1555, the Queen wrote to Philip, realizing that she was surrounded by enemies and could not move without endangering the crown. When she reached the age of 40, Mary was a deeply disappointed woman. Her campaign to eliminate heresy had not only made her universally hated, but also had increased the Protestant's conviction. After three years on the throne, Mary had lost the love and support of her subjects, while Elizabeth won the hearts of the English people. The Queen also had to face personal sadness. After the fiasco of the false pregnancy, Prince Philip left for the Netherlands and did not return. Her letters often sent to her husband were unanswered. There were rumors that he was a womanizer. With so many disappointments, the Queen dedicated herself to Catholic devotion, with various works of charity. In 1556, Philip inherited the throne from Spain and wanted to return to England. Mary was expectant, but her husband's visit was purely political. He wanted English support to attack France. Her husband was cold, and she decided to support the invasion of France, even with opposition from Parliament. In 1557, Philip got some important victories, but the French King Henry II waited for the right time to launch his attack in the port of Calais, the last great English possession in the European continent. For Mary, the loss of Calais was devastating. The Queen thought she was pregnant again. She took her time to warn Philip until she was sure. In December, she wrote a letter saying that she would give birth in March. In February 1558, Mary's advisors pressed her to deal with the country's finances. During her reign, the English economy went into depression and contracted large debts. The problems had increased with the cost of war in France. The Queen was still strangely out of touch. There was a feeling that she was leaving the world. To make matters worse, her closest advisor, Cardinal Pole, was also dying. In May, no baby was born, and it became evidence that the Queen's dilated belly was the external sign of edema, an accumulation of fluid under the skin and inside the body, which usually causes the kidney to fail. As the disease progressed, the Queen became feverish, and in August, her doctors predicted that her death would happen soon. Mary died on the morning of November the 17th, 1558, at the age of 42. Before dying, she made a gloomy prediction that, if they open her body after death, the words Philip and Calais will be found in her heart. After her death, many unscrupulous stories about Mary's cruelty began to circulate. For example, she had ordered her father's heart to be burned for the pain he had caused her mother. From what we have reported here, the title of bloodthirsty attributed to Mary is inaccurate. Both in life and death, she suffered all the public and personal pains, when she only wanted to promote the stability of her kingdom, fed by the strong Catholic education. 
To conclude, it seems much more apt to say that she was the daughter of the circumstances that led her to ascend to the throne while trying to keep it. Her attitudes are perfectly explainable when analyzing her trajectory. The life of a woman who suffered, loved, and fought for what she thought was right, paying dearly for pursuing happiness in a society that did not see female governance with good eyes, of which Mary was an exponent. What do you think? Do you agree that the epithet Bloody Mary is deserved? Or did she just act according to the circumstances of her time?